It was supposed to be a simple hiking trip in the Oregon wilderness, a break from hectic work life. I stumbled upon the cabin purely by chance, a quaint structure seemingly untouched by time, hidden in a dense part of the forest. The first night was peaceful, with only the sounds of the forest to keep me company. But when I woke up the next morning, something felt off. The calendar on the wall showed the same date as the day before. I brushed it off as a mistake, until I realized that everything outside was exactly as I had found it the previous day. The same fallen branch on the path, which I had picked up and moved. The same pattern of mist swirling in the trees. As the day progressed, it became clear that I was reliving the same day. When night fell, eerie things started to happen. Shadows danced in the corners of the room, and faint whispers echoed through the cabin, though nobody was there to make them. The next morning it happened again, the same date, the same unchanging scenery. But this time I noticed something new, a hidden compartment in the floorboards containing a diary. The diary belonged to a woman who had lived in the cabin decades ago. Each repeating day, I uncovered more of her story. She wrote about her lover, a soldier who was supposed to return from war. But as days turned into years, his letters stopped, and Emily, the author, was left waiting, her heart growing heavy with uncertainty and sorrow. Nightly, the cabin seemed to replay fragments of her emotions. The whispers seemed to be fragments of her prayers for her lover's return. The shadows were manifestations of her growing despair. On what felt like the tenth repetition of the same night, I found a final entry in the diary that I hadn't seen before. It was written in a shaky hand, the ink blurred by what I assumed were tears. Emily had learned of her lover's death, her hopes shattered. Overcome with grief, she could not bear the weight of living in a world without him. I realized that the cabin was stuck in a time loop, echoing Emily's last days of heartache. That night, I spoke to the cabin, to Emily's lingering spirit. I told her that everything was different now, and that if she was waiting for him, he wouldn't find her here. He would be where she should go, the other side, whatever that is. The next morning, I finally awoke to change. The calendar had moved forward one day. The forest seemed different, alive with sounds and movements that had been absent before. And the diary was gone. The Night of Knocking Last fall, my friend Hannah and I decided to spend a weekend in a secluded cabin in the Cascades. It was an ideal spot for a beautiful, peaceful getaway, or so we thought. The cabin, nestled in a thickly wooded area, was rustic and charming, the perfect escape from our busy city lives and corporate jobs. Our first day was uneventful, filled with hiking and enjoying the tranquil surroundings, as night fell, we settled in, lighting a fire and sharing stories. And that's when the banging started. It began as a soft thudding on the walls, so faint we thought it might be an animal outside. But as the night progressed, the banging grew louder and more persistent, echoing around the entire cabin. It was as if someone, or something, was circling the cabin pounding on the walls with relentless intensity. We were terrified, huddling together in the living room. Every time we mustered the courage to peek outside, we saw nothing but the dark, dense forest. And in some ways, that made it all worse. The banging continued, 
rhythmic and unyielding, creating a symphony of terror that made it impossible to think straight, let alone sleep. We sat wide-eyed and anxious, waiting for dawn. When the first light of morning finally broke, the banging stopped abruptly. We cautiously stepped outside, our nerves on edge. That's when we saw them. Footprints encircling the cabin. But these were not ordinary footprints. They were large, misshapen, with too many toes, and they didn't resemble any animal we knew. The sight of those bizarre, unidentifiable tracks sent a new wave of fear through us, because whatever made them, we couldn't see. We packed up quickly, hardly speaking as we hurried to leave the cabin behind. The drive back was silent. I think we were both just trying to make sense of what had just happened to us. We never went back to that cabin. What was lurking in the woods? What was its intention? Maybe some questions are just better left unanswered. I've stayed in many hotels during my business travels, but nothing compares to what I experienced at the Harlow Hotel, an old Victorian establishment in the heart of Maine. Renowned for its antique charm and rumored to be haunted, the Harlow was a place I had always wanted to visit, drawn by a mix of fascination and skepticism. I checked in on a chilly October evening. The lobby was adorned with vintage furnishings and the dim light added to the hotel's mystique. The receptionist, an older gentleman with a polite smile, handed me the key to room 307, casually mentioning that it was one of the hotel's special rooms. I didn't think much of it at the time. The room was elegant, with heavy drapes and an ornate four-poster bed. There was a palpable sense of history in those walls, and I felt like I had stepped back in time. Tired from my journey, I decided to call it an early night. I must have drifted off about midnight when a sudden coldness woke me up. The room felt icy, and I could see my breath in the air. Confused, I sat up, and that's when I saw her. A woman, dressed in a flowing white gown, standing at the foot of my bed. Her hair was dark, her face pale, and her eyes... They were filled with this unspeakable sadness. I blinked, thinking that it was a trick of the light, but she was still there, looking right at me. My heart raced, and every rational explanation I tried to muster crumbled in the face of the undeniable reality before me. She was a ghost, as real as the room around me. Frozen with fear, I watched as she slowly raised her hand, pointing toward the window. Her lips moved, but no sound came out. It was as if she was trying to tell me something. The air grew colder, and the room seemed to darken. I said, what do you want? My voice was barely a whisper. She continued to point, and then, as suddenly as she had appeared, she vanished. The room returned to its normal temperature, and the oppressive feeling lifted. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. At dawn, I went down to the lobby, determined to find out more about my midnight visitor in my special room. The receptionist listened to my story with a knowing nod, and then told me the tale of Elizabeth Harlow, the original owner's daughter, who had fallen to her death from the room's window many years ago. Her spirit, he claimed, was said to roam the hotel, forever trapped in a moment of despair. I checked out of the Harlow Hotel that morning, unable to shake the image of Elizabeth's ghostly figure from my mind. I've always been a skeptic, but what I saw in room 307 was beyond rational explanation. It was an encounter that has stayed with me, and I hope I don't experience anything like that again.
My name is Ethan, and I've always been fascinated by the concept of glitches in the matrix, those moments that challenge our perception of reality. But I never expected to experience such a phenomenon myself, especially not during my trip to Seoul, South Korea. It was my first visit to the vibrant city, and I was eager to explore. One afternoon, I decided to take the subway to visit the historic Jeongbokgun Palace. The Seoul subway system is known for its efficiency, so I was confident about navigating it despite the language barrier. I boarded a train at Gangnam Station, a bustling hub of activity. The carriage was crowded, and I found myself squeezed between commuters. After a few stops, the crowd thinned out, and I took a seat, watching the cityscape pass by through the window. That's when things took a surreal turn. The train pulled into a station, and the doors opened, but something was off. The platform was completely empty, not a single person in sight. This was highly unusual, given Seoul's dense population and the constant flow of people in the subway. But what really got to me was the station itself. It looked old, almost abandoned, with flickering lights and peeling paint. It didn't match the modern, well-maintained appearance of the other stations I had seen. The electronic sign that usually displayed the station name was blank. Confused, I looked around at the other passengers, but they seemed unfazed, buried in their phones or dozing off. I thought about asking someone, but before I could, the doors closed and the train moved on. The next station was just as I expected, lively and crowded. It was as if the eerie, empty station had been a total figment of my imagination. I got off at my intended stop, still trying to make sense of what I had seen. Throughout my stay in Seoul, I asked locals and fellow travelers about the station, but no one knew what I was talking about. I even took the same subway line multiple times, but that mysterious abandoned station never appeared again. I did a little bit of research and found that there was no record of any such station existing. It was like I had passed through a place that was momentarily caught between realities, a glitch in the word that I knew it as. To this day, I still wonder about that experience. Was it a trick of the mind, a momentary lapse in my perception? or a window into another reality. The Seoul subway anomaly remains a complete mystery to me, a personal encounter with something I'll probably never be able to explain, but it was a really cool experience either way. I've always been a bit on the fence about paranormal stuff, but what happened to me a few weeks ago has me leaning towards believing. It was late, and I was just dozing off in bed. You know, that half-asleep, half-awake state. Suddenly, I get this weird feeling like someone's watching me. I try to shrug it off as just being tired, but the feeling gets stronger. So, I open my eyes, and I see this this shadowy figure standing at the end of my bed. Now, I'm not talking about a regular shadow. This was different. It was darker than the darkness around it, if that makes any sense. And it was in the shape of a person, but all blurry around the edges. It just stood there, not moving, like it was watching me. I'm lying there, heart pounding, trying to figure out if I'm dreaming or if this is really happening. I blink a few times, hoping it'll disappear, but it's still there. I can't see any features, just this dark, human-shaped silhouette. I want to scream or run, but I'm frozen. It's like this figure has me locked in place with fear. Then, as I'm staring at it, it starts to fade, just slowly dissolves into the darkness until it's gone. The room's back to normal, but I'm wide awake now, scared out of my mind. I turn on all the lights, check every corner of my room, but there's nothing. No sign of anyone or anything that could have made that shadow. 
I didn't sleep much after that, kept the lights on and just waited for morning. I even started sleeping with the lights on for a few nights after that. I've tried to come up with some logical explanation. Maybe it was a trick of the light, or my mind playing tricks on me from being half asleep. But deep down, I don't know. It felt too real, too vivid. I haven't seen the shadow figure since then, but I can't shake the feeling of being watched when I'm in my room at night. It's like that one encounter has left this lingering sense of unease. Ghost, hallucination, or something else. I can't say for sure, but it's definitely made me question what's really out there, in the dark, when we think we're alone. My name is Kim, and last summer, I embarked on a solo hiking trip across Sweden, a country known for its breathtaking landscapes and rich folklore. One particular legend that had always intrigued me was that of the Storskogen Shadow, a mysterious entity said to roam the vast, dense forests of central Sweden. Locals spoke of it, although not often, but when they did, they said it was this spirit that guarded the woods against intruders. I arrived in a small village on the edge of Thorskogen, the great forest, armed with nothing but my backpack and a healthy dose of skepticism. The villagers warned me against venturing too deep into the forest, but honestly, their warnings only fueled my curiosity. The first few days of my hike were uneventful, filled with the serene beauty of nature. It was on the fourth night, camped in a clearing, that things took a turn. The air grew much colder than it should have, and a thick fog enveloped my tent. I heard whispers, seemingly carried on the wind, unintelligible, but unmistakably human. Stepping outside, I saw this tall, shadowy figure standing at the edge of the clearing. It was blurry, like a wisp of smoke, but it had a presence that was undeniably solid at the same time. It stood perfectly still, but I could feel its gaze on me. My heart raced with fear and fascination. I knew this had to be the Storskogen shadow. Gathering my courage, I approached it, but with each step I took, the figure seemed to recede, always remaining just out of reach. The whispers grew louder, a chorus of voices that seemed to echo the sorrow of the forest itself. And then, without warning, the figure raised its arm and pointed toward a part of the woods I hadn't explored. The gesture was clear. It wanted me to follow. Driven by an urge I can't explain, I complied, venturing deeper into Storskogen than I had ever planned. The forest here was ancient, the trees towering and gnarled. The shadow led me to a secluded grove, where the remains of an old stone structure lay hidden beneath overgrowth. The air was heavy with the scent of moss and earth, and I felt as if I had stumbled upon a forgotten piece of history. As I explored the ruins, the shadow watched, its form becoming more defined, almost human. It was then that I understood. This was a guardian spirit, tied to the land and its history, guiding me to a place lost to time, but not to memory. I spent hours in the grove, feeling this overwhelming sense of peace. When I finally looked up, the shadow was gone, and the forest seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. I made my way back to my camp, the experience still rattling in my mind, playing like a movie. I left Storskogen the next day, carrying with me a respect for the legend that I had witnessed. The shadow was more than just a tale. It was something that wanted us to remember, something that wanted us to respect memories long past but not forgotten. And you know what? I will. So, 
I've got to tell you about this eerie thing that happened at my place. I've always been a bit skeptical about paranormal stuff, but this incident, well, it was just weird. I live in this old house, and there's an attic that I rarely ever go into. It's just filled with boxes and old furniture. One night, I'm in my room, and I start hearing these faint noises. It sounded like whispers coming from above, the attic. Initially, I thought it was just the wind or the house settling. You know, the usual stuff you tell yourself. But the whispers kept getting louder and more distinct. It sounded like a conversation, but I couldn't make out the words. So, I muster up some courage, grab a flashlight, and head up to the attic. The moment I pull down the ladder and climb up, the air gets colder. I'm telling you, it was like walking into a freezer. I shine the light around, but there's nothing out of the ordinary, just the stuff I stored up there. The whispers, though, they're still there. It's like they're coming from the walls. I call out, asking if anyone's there, half expecting an answer. But nothing, just more whispers. I'm not gonna lie, I was freaked out. I quickly checked if maybe there was a radio or something left on, but nada. The attic was as silent as a grave, aside from those whispers. I headed back down, deciding that some things are better left alone. But the whispers didn't stop. For the next few nights, I heard them, always around the same time, always just as unintelligible. I even got a buddy of mine to come over and check it out. He heard them too, so I knew I wasn't going crazy. But we couldn't find the source. He joked about it being ghosts, but I wasn't too sure it was just a joke. Eventually, I just couldn't handle the creepiness. I called in a professional to check for any structural issues or animals stuck in the walls. They didn't find anything unusual. The whispers stopped after a while, and I haven't heard them since. It's still a mystery to me. Were they echoes of some past conversation, trapped in the old walls? I don't know, and maybe it's better that way. But let me tell you, every time I pass by the attic door, I can't help but listen closely, half expecting to hear those whispers again. All right, buckle up for this one. It's about the weirdest thing that's happened to me in my own house. I'm not usually one to get spooked easily, but this, this was just bizarre. So I've got this spot in my living room, right in front of the old fireplace that's been sealed up for ages. Nothing strange about it, until one day, out of the blue, it just gets cold. I mean, really cold, like stepping into an invisible fridge. The rest of the room would be totally normal, but this one spot was just freezing. At first, I thought there must be a draft or something. I checked all the windows, the doors, even got the fireplace inspected to see if there was a breeze coming through. Nothing. Everything was sealed tight, and the maintenance guys said the heating was working perfectly. But it kept happening, always in the same spot. I'd walk through the room, and as soon as I hit that spot, I'd feel this intense cold. It was so weird, and it started to really creep me out. I even did a little experiment. I placed a thermometer in that spot and watched the temperature drop whenever I approached it. We're talking a good 10 to 15 degrees colder than the rest of the room. And it wasn't a gradual change either. It was like crossing an invisible line into a cold zone. Friends who came over noticed it too. They'd walk into the cold spot and just freeze, no pun intended. What the heck is this? They'd say. Some laughed it off, but others were just as weirded out as I was. Then other strange things started happening around that spot. Like, I'd leave a cup of coffee on the table near it, and it would get cold in minutes. Or I'd find the cat, who loves warmth, 
deliberately avoiding that area, which was totally out of character for her. One night, things got even weirder. I was sitting on the couch, watching TV, and I saw something out of the corner of my eye near that cold spot. It was like a faint flicker, almost like a shadow, but not quite. When I looked directly at it, there was nothing there. It happened a few more times, and each time I saw this flicker in my peripheral vision, but nothing when I faced it head on. I started to wonder if there was something more to this cold spot than just a weird temperature anomaly. It felt almost like, like there was a presence there. I know how it sounds, but you had to feel it to believe it. Things around that cold spot in my living room started escalating. The air around it didn't just feel cold, it started to feel charged, like static electricity before a storm. And those flickers I mentioned? They became more frequent, like shadows dancing at the edge of my vision. I decided to dig a little deeper into the history of my house, particularly that old sealed up fireplace. Turns out, the house had quite a bit of history. It was one of the oldest in the neighborhood and had seen its share of owners. But here's the kicker. The fireplace was sealed up after a fire in the early 1900s. A fire that, tragically, claimed a life. The more I learned, the more things started to click into place. It felt like maybe, just maybe, the cold spot had something to do with that old incident. I'm not typically one for ghost stories, but I couldn't ignore the coincidences. I started to pay more attention to the spot, even tried talking to it. Yeah, I know, it sounds crazy. I'd ask if someone was there, if they needed help. Most times, nothing happened. But one evening, as I was about to give up, the temperature in the spot dropped drastically. I felt this intense sadness, like a wave of emotion washing over me. And for a brief moment, I thought I heard a faint whisper, but I couldn't make out any words. This whole situation was getting to me. I wasn't sleeping well, constantly thinking about that spot, the fire, the person who died. It felt like there was unfinished business, like something was lingering. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I contacted a local group that dealt with paranormal stuff, not ghost hunters or anything, but more like historical researchers with an interest in paranormal phenomena. They came over, did some readings, and actually confirmed a significant temperature drop in that spot. They also felt a presence, a kind of residual energy. Their theory? It was a kind of imprint left behind, an emotional or energetic residue from the tragic event. They did some kind of clearing, a way to acknowledge and release the trapped energy. I don't know if it was psychological or if they really did something, but after that, the cold spot warmed up. The room felt lighter, and those weird flickers in my peripheral vision stopped. Since then, things have been normal. The living room feels just like any other room in the house. I still think about it sometimes, about who might have been there with me. Was it real? A ghost? Or just some strange environmental quirk? I guess I'll never know for sure. But one thing's certain, I have a new respect for the history of old houses and the stories they might hold. It started happening to me a few months ago. I'd put something down, like my keys or my phone, and then, poof, it'd just vanish. I'm talking about one minute it's there, and the next, it's like it never existed. At first, I figured I was just being forgetful. You know, misplacing stuff and not remembering. But then it started happening more frequently, and with things I was absolutely sure I hadn't moved. Like this one time, I placed my glasses on my nightstand before going to sleep. When I woke up, they were gone. 
I tore apart my room looking for them, only to find them later in the kitchen, in a drawer I hardly ever use. And I live alone, so no one else could have moved them. Or another time, I was making a sandwich. I set the knife down for a second, and when I went to grab it again, it was gone. I found it later in the living room, on a shelf. I mean, how does that even happen? It got to the point where I started questioning my own memory. Was I moving these things and just not remembering? But some of these occurrences were so bizarre, it just didn't make sense. I did some digging online and found out that this kind of thing isn't entirely unheard of. It's sometimes called the disappearing object phenomenon, and it's a real head-scratcher. People all over report similar experiences, objects disappearing and reappearing in the most random of places, often with no logical explanation. Some say it's just absent-mindedness or stress, but others think it might be something more, like glitches in reality or even paranormal activity. I don't know what to believe, but it's definitely weird. These days, whenever something disappears, I just wait it out. More often than not, it shows up again in some odd place. It's become a bizarre but regular part of my life. So, if you ever find your stuff randomly vanishing, just know you're not alone. It's weird, it's frustrating, but hey, it's also kind of fascinating. I'm Jordan, and I've always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie, seeking out thrill and adventure wherever I can find it. But nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered in rural Ohio. This is my experience on a desolate road in Morrow County, and it still sends shivers down my spine. It was late October, and I was driving back from a friend's house in the countryside. I've always enjoyed taking the scenic route, especially when it's fall and the leaves are that beautiful riot of colors. On a whim, I turned onto an old, barely used road that wound through dense woods. The sun was setting and the shadows grew long with every passing minute. As I drove, the road seemed to get narrower, the trees closing in around me. I hadn't seen another car for miles and my phone had lost signal. That's when my car suddenly sputtered and died, right in the middle of the road. I tried to restart it, but it was no use. It was as if the car had completely given up. Stepping out into the twilight, I felt an eerie stillness in the air. The only sounds were the rustling leaves and my own breathing. I decided to walk a bit, hoping to find a spot with phone signal or at least figure out where I was. I hadn't walked far, when I heard this soft, haunting melody, it was almost like somebody humming a tune. It seemed to come from the woods beside the road. I was curious and a little put off, but I followed the sound, venturing off the path into the trees. The melody grew clearer, a melancholic tune that seemed oddly familiar. And that's when I saw this woman dressed in a white gown she seemed to almost glow in the fading light. She was sitting on a fallen log, her back to me, her hair long and dark. I called out to her asking if she needed help, but she didn't respond. As I approached, she stopped humming. The silence that followed was oppressive. Then she turned to face me. Her eyes were hollow, like dark wells and her skin was unnaturally pale. In that moment, I knew in my soul she wasn't human. I stumbled backward, my heart racing. She stood up, her movement slow and deliberate, and began to walk toward me. I turned and ran, not daring to look back. The woods seemed to close in around me, branches scratching at my face and arms as I pushed through. Finally, I got back onto the road, gasping for breath, and I didn't stop running until I got to my car. To my absolute disbelief, the moment I touched the door handle, 
the headlights flickered on, and the engine roared to life as if nothing had ever gone wrong. I didn't look back even as I drove away. I wanted to leave that road and whatever ghost was on it far behind. I later learned that that road was known for strange sightings and unexplained phenomena, at least locally. It was often linked to this old legend about a bride who had lost her life there decades ago. Classic story, I suppose. Every town has its jilted bride. That night in Morrow County changed me. It was a reminder that there are a lot of things in this world that defy explanation. And sometimes, maybe it's best to leave it that way. Unexplained and unrepeated. All right, so this is a bit out there, but it's totally true. I never really believed in haunted objects or anything like that, but then I got this old doll from my grandmother's attic, and let me tell you, it's freaky. So this doll, it's one of those old porcelain ones, pretty but kind of creepy with those glassy eyes. I put it on a shelf in my living room, just as a decoration. Nothing weird at first, but then, things started happening. I'd come into the room, and the doll would be in a different position than I left it. At first, I thought I was just being forgetful. Maybe I moved it and didn't remember, right? But then it kept happening, more and more. The doll's head would be turned, or its arms would be in a different position. It was subtle, but noticeable. One day, I even found it sitting on my couch. Now, I live alone so there's no way someone else was moving it. That's when I started to get really creeped out. I mean, how does a doll just move on its own? So, I did a little experiment. I positioned the doll in a certain way and took a picture. The next day, sure enough, it had moved. And it wasn't like it fell over or anything. It was sitting up, posed differently. I showed my friends, and they thought I was pranking them but I swear, it's true. This doll was changing positions all on its own. I even tried locking it in a cabinet, and somehow, it would still end up somewhere else in the room. After a few weeks of this, I couldn't handle it anymore. It was too weird, too unsettling. So I wrapped the doll up and put it back in my grandmother's attic. Since then, nothing strange has happened, but I still get chills thinking about it. I don't know if it was really haunted or what, but that doll definitely had a mind of its own. No more antique dolls for me, thank you very much. Upon first moving into my house, my two-year-old niece, who was living with me, was keeping herself entertained in a corner as I busied myself with renovations, specifically pulling up the carpet. Suddenly, her usually lively demeanor changed, and she quietly approached, sitting next to me. Despite her limited vocabulary at that age, she was a chatterbox, yet she chose not to utter a single word at that moment. Feeling a change of scenery might help, I decided to bring her outside, settling on the lawn with her. Still, she remained uncharacteristically silent. Eventually, I probed if something had frightened her, and in response, she merely nodded, clinging to me in a tight hug. Fast forwarding about eight to 12 months later, during her bedtime routine one night, she casually mentioned something about a white man. Intrigued, I asked her to explain who this white man was. She replied nonchalantly, Oh, he doesn't live in my house. He just stands outside.
I feel like I should start this story with a content warning first side. About three days ago, I had a pretty weird dream. I dreamt that the mother of my mom's friend committed side. I don't remember how, I just remember getting the news from her grandson in the dream. Never met the woman in my life. I only heard about her a few times about a month or two ago. Skip to today. My mom receives a call from the friend and my stomach just drops. It's like I know that something's wrong. And it is. The woman had hung herself about a half an hour prior. What the heck just happened? Was it all a creepy coincidence? I don't have any emotional connection with that woman at all, nor had I been thinking about her before the dream occurred. My grandmother also had some dream predictions before, but no major events, just some random things. It's really unsettling to me, and I have no idea how to explain it. When my nephew was a toddler, about two years old, he would cry at night and say that there was a man in a hat in the closet who would talk to him. He was petrified and he wouldn't even sleep in his bedroom anymore. He would only sleep in his sister's room every night. My brother lives in a home that was built by our grandfather. Our grandfather had cancer when we were teens. By the time it was found, it was really too late. Near the end of his life, we brought him back home and we turned the office room into a hospital room. That same room, many years later, had become my nephew's bedroom. My brother, sister-in-law, and I were all living at the house at the time, and we were all a bit startled. We didn't think it could actually be our grandfather, though. I mean, he wasn't the type of man to pop out of a closet in the dark and scare the shit out of a toddler. Whatever it was that my nephew saw, or thought he saw, has left him afraid of the dark and still prefers to sleep in the same room as his sister to this day. When I was younger, I used to spend hours in the woods behind my house. One time, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I was in the woods and I saw some stepping stones that led into a clearing. Those stones had never been there before. I peeked into the clearing and saw this little cabin with smoke coming from the chimney. It was surrounded by a well-manicured lawn. Although it looked peaceful, charming even, something in my head said, run. So I did. About a week later, I went back into the woods to the same spot and the clearing was normal again. No stones, no cabin, just a basic clearing, the same one that I had grown up with. I haven't stepped into those woods again ever since and it's been about 20 years. I don't know what that cabin was, how it appeared or why it disappeared. And I don't know what would have happened if I had followed the steps and gone up to it. But to this day, I'm just very glad that I didn't. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to pick up some drinks. As we each threw out suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple of swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 p.m. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then began heading toward the lake. 
I begin to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning right behind the tree, I notice a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat and a red coat on him. That sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. Sort of looked like a doorway. I didn't think twice to stick around and I tried to play it cool as if nothing happened and returned to my group. I never mentioned it to anyone, but can confirm, I think there are gnomes in San Francisco. When I was seven, I woke up in the middle of the night to steal some biscuits from the kitchen. Our kitchen is right beside our conservatory, which has a big open window that allows you to glance out into the garden. While eating, I heard some chatter from outside. Curious, I went to go peer outside the window. I saw three little men in red pointy hats outside in my garden bickering amongst themselves in a strange language I've never heard of before or after. I was so stricken with terror that I didn't speak. I ran to my parents' bedroom to tell them about the intruders. My dad was reluctant to believe me, but he could see that I was obviously shaken up by something and came downstairs to investigate. They must have heard us coming, because by the time we'd gotten to the conservatory, they'd already pegged it and were running through the back gate. My dad got a glimpse of them too, but he only saw their red pointy hats. I've never seen him look so scared before, or in such complete disbelief. I'm still completely baffled by the whole thing. This happened when I was in college. I had just gotten to school that morning, pretty normal day. Students were wandering around and chatting with one another. When I was nearing our building, I recognized a classmate from one of my subjects. We're not that close, but we greet each other. When our eyes met, I smiled at her. She didn't smile back. I thought that was really weird because she's a really bubbly girl. She was just standing across from the building. There were quite a few students around her too. I can still remember that she was wearing a yellow blouse and was holding something in her hands. She was literally just staring at me, poker face, while I proceeded to go inside the building. That's when it got weirder. Just as I rounded the corner, I saw her, but in different clothes and with a much happier attitude. I told her right away that I had just seen her outside, but she just laughed it off. She said that she had never been there. I knew she didn't have a twin sister. It was so weird, and I got really confused. I didn't know what I had experienced, or who or what I had seen, so I just headed to my classroom without telling anyone else about it. This happened to me on February 22nd at 4 in the morning. That night, I had heard strange noises, but I always hear strange noises, so I just shrugged it off as I went to sleep. I remember that I was lucid dreaming, but I don't remember what about. All I remember is that the dream felt extremely weird. For some reason, I woke up from the dream suddenly, and I saw flashing lights in front of me. But as soon as I realized I was paralyzed, I turned my eyes to the side to see some weird thing staring at me with long hair and their eyes completely open. They were around 10 inches from my face and as soon as I saw them, my ears got clogged and I heard a screeching noise so loud that it hurt my ears. But the weird thing is that I know that nobody else in the house heard it, even with it being as loud as it was. 
It sounded as though it were in my head, but my ears could feel the pain of the noise. I don't know how, but I managed to force my body to move, and I ran out of the room without looking back. When I explained what had happened to my sister, she said the same thing had happened to her like four or five times when she used to stay in the same room. Has this ever happened to anyone else before? In the summer, my parents rented an Airbnb in Holton, Maine. It was a very old farmhouse, but it was recently renovated. The fields and sunsets were beautiful. I always felt like something was watching me. It wasn't a bad feeling though. We celebrated my birthday there, and that night I had a crazy dream. A woman named Gladys introduced herself to me and told me that this was her home. She told me she loved having my family and I there. She said that she never wanted us to leave. She also said that our birthdays are very close together as well. In the dream, Gladys and I played a board game and talked about so much, her past, her family, things like that. I tried so hard not to Google her name and see what came up until after I left to go home. But my curiosity got the best of me. Turns out there was an old woman named Gladys who lived there and died about a year earlier. Her birthday was August 10th, and mine is August 7th. The picture that was in her obituary looked exactly like the woman that I saw in the dream. That's how I know that it was her. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to buy alcohol. As we each threw in suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, which is a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 at night. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then we began to head toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning, right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat, a red coat, and this figure was extremely short. This sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. It looked a little bit like a doorway. I didn't really want to stick around. I played it cool as if nothing had happened and returned to my group. And of course, I never mentioned it to anyone. But I'm pretty sure I saw a gnome at Stowe Lake. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, You are not the first one that that has happened to. 
Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. The creepiest thing I've ever seen in the middle of nowhere was in the forest at this place we called the Tar Pits. They were these deep ruts in the ground, maybe three to four feet deep, and they were filled with this purple green muck that acted a lot like quicksand. It sucked in and consumed whatever had the unfortunate fate of wandering into it. If a small vehicle got stuck in it, it normally took a bulldozer to pull them out, with significant damage to the vehicle in the process. The stuff would rip the bumper right off a vehicle while being pulled out. One summer, we had a brutal drought, and the tar pits dried up. Along the bottom of the holes was a giant pile of bones, animals that I figure stepped in and couldn't get out. A lot were clearly deer, with some squirrels, possums, and some that could have been foxes or dogs. I haven't been over there in years, and I don't know if it's still like that, but I would love to know what that stuff was. That muck was the weirdest stuff I've ever seen. Probably not paranormal, but still creepy. We were going camping in Western Washington. It was late and we weren't going to make it to our usual campsite. So my uncle mentioned that he knew about a lake not far off the freeway. My uncle had a box truck and we were all going to sleep in it. There were six kids and my uncle and father. My dad was driving an old Bronco with some of us with him. When we found the lake and parked, us kids went to bed in the box truck because it was close to midnight. My dad and uncle started a campfire and were just BSing. I couldn't sleep, so I was chilling in my sleeping bag listening to them. All of a sudden, we started hearing wild noises, like chanting, and then these sounds that just made the hair on my neck stand straight up. I immediately thought Bigfoot. My dad and uncle freaked out, and my dad got his pistol out. They waited another 10 minutes, and the sounds got louder. Then they got everybody up and packed us all up, and we left in a hurry. I have never seen them that scared. We were all scared. I have no idea what the location was now. I was nine years old, and this was back in the 80s. But that experience never left me. I was really young. I can't remember how young, but I must have been under six. I was at my grandparents, and they have an outside sauna in a building with a workshop next to it. I was with my grandpa, and we were talking about something as we entered the sauna. Then my grandpa goes to the heater to put logs in, or maybe to store them next to it. I can't really remember which. But I was facing the benches as we were talking. The next thing I know, there's a little gnome that peeked its head over and looked straight at me from a hole where all the water goes onto the floor. It must have been only a second because I stood still and silent and then it just went away. I told my grandpa, but I don't know if he took it seriously. I didn't know how to feel. I was fascinated, but a little creeped out by it. Later, my grandpa told me something about gnomes living underground as it is often in Finnish folklore, which made it even more mysterious to me. I know it wasn't a dream, because it shocked me and I remember it so clearly, and I was wide awake. I didn't know where to tell this story, I just thought it would be interesting to tell.
This took place about eight to 10 years ago and has never happened again. To begin, let me set the scene. This happened in a hallway, which is more like a cube. Perspective is from the top of the stairs looking at the hallway. The stairs down are at the back end and stairs up to the left. My mother's office is directly to the right. There's a small sliver of wall where we have a plaque and then my sister's room. A bit to the left of that, there's my room. The left wall has the closet and an inlet which has the bathroom door directly across from my mother's office. For some reason, we were all talking. My mother was in her office. My sister was at the door to her room. I was in the doorway to the bathroom. Remember that plaque I mentioned? Out of nowhere, it flew off of its J-shaped hook and landed right next to me. We all saw it happen. There are no vents around it, and it's way too heavy to be moved by a breeze. It didn't break, and we were all just like, well, that just happened. My mom put it back on the hook, and we just went on with our day. We still cannot explain this. I care for my niece full time, so she's like a daughter to me. She's done some peculiar things over the years, but here are a few that stand out. Once when she was still a toddler, I was roused from sleep by the sensation of my hair being brushed. As I opened my eyes, she simply whispered, shh, and attempted to close my eyelids, much like one might do for the deceased. On another occasion, when she was feeling under the weather, we lay in bed watching a movie. Out of the blue, amid the film, she warned, don't let your feet hang off the bed like that. The devil can grab you and pull you to hell. Given she's only five, I can only hope that she overheard that from another child at school. At least I hope so. And lastly, as I was preparing dinner one evening, she strolled nonchalantly through the kitchen and said, I'll get you and I'll make it look like a bloody accident. It terrified me at the moment, but I later discovered that she had lifted the line from Cat in the Hat. She's a great kid, but she has definitely given me some spooks a time or two. My family owns a factory in the north of England. The building is 1890s as far as I can tell and was built as a large shed for boilers that provided steam to power the steam engines in the big mill next door. The mill has since been demolished. It has a large water tank underneath it and a system to collect rainwater. The roof is made with cast iron trestles that incorporate internal gutters. It's fascinating. My brother is convinced that the place is haunted. Stuff apparently moves around on its own and voices have been heard in the factory from the office when the factory was empty. We had an old bloke working for us a few years back who swears he saw the ghost of a man on several occasions. He did used to secretly drink several cans of John Smith's bitter whilst on shift though, so who knows? But he's not the only one. So far, I haven't experienced anything. But if I do, I'll be sure to let you know. I still have no reasonable explanation for this. I remember my first day of my new school. This was only a couple of years ago. I remember exploring the school for the first time. I clearly remember walking up a large flight of stairs to a second floor. I remember there being two water fountains to the left 
and the stairs being next to the bathrooms. I never went there again since it was on the opposite end, and it wasn't there the next year when I checked it out. My friend clearly remembers the exact same thing. They weren't fake memories because we both remember the exact same thing. However, nobody other than him and me and maybe a couple of other people remember it. We decided to check it out one day and look for any sign of a second floor in and around the bathrooms, but there was nothing. Where there were stairs, there was just a blank wall. We even asked around and a couple of very confused people told us that the school had never had a second floor. I am so confused. In my life, I think I have seen a UFO twice. I just wanna know what everybody thinks. Number one, I was 14 and I was in Spain. I was looking up at the night sky when suddenly this kind of round thing flew low overhead. From what I remember, it was round with yellow and small white lights around the underside. It was really odd. I remember seeing it, but my family says it never happened but I know what I saw. Number two, this one originally looked like a star sitting outside the back of our house one night we were all looking up and we saw this star moving across the sky. We were all like, oh look, a satellite. We were tracking it going west, but then things got strange. It stopped and started going west. You might say, oh, well, perhaps it was a plane planes don't move like that. It stopped again, then went north, and then it just disappeared, just blinked out. Did I see a UFO? 